So section 12.3 was all about measures of central tendency and dispersion, looking at standard deviation, which tells of the data set overall as a whole. Okay, we're not looking at individual items, we're looking at how is the data behaving over this entire span. So the measures of central tendency and dispersion tell of the data set overall as a whole. And we'll just kind of review the basics that we talked about in the last couple sections. So the central tendency tells us what? Where along a number scale the overall data is centered at. So where along a number scale the overall data is centered. And we've been using the mean a lot, but we still have the median and the mode. Can't forget about those ones. Measures of central tendency. The dispersion of something. So how much the data is actually spread out from that center point. So what is our maximum reach on either side? So how much data, how much the data is spread out from the center point. Whatever we've used to define the center point. Okay, and Chebyshev's theorem told us how much data can actually fit within a certain number of standard deviations from the mean. So what portions of the data, or what parts, what portions of the data of the data set may be dispersed uh, different amounts from the mean from I guess any center point, this center point. We usually stick with the mean but we still have those other ways of talking about the central tendency. Okay, so again, these were talking about the data set overall as a whole. But now we want to start looking at measures of position. So what individual item uh, sits within this entire data set? Instead of looking at it big scale, we want to zero in on a couple specific items. So we want to look at the individual items in a data set. So we've got four different measures of position that we're going to talk about. Z-score, I think, is the most important. Percentiles, you've probably seen or at least heard of before. Deciles and quartiles, very similar to percentiles, but divvied up into a different uh, number of chunks over the entire scale. And then a box and whisker plot, which you've probably seen before, but if it's been a while, we'll just review uh, what they show. So that first one that we're going to talk about is the Z-score. And it's super duper important. So we have to know what is the z-score of an item. So the z-score is of a specific item. Specific item. We're not looking grand scale as a whole anymore. I'm zeroing in on one item. What is its position in the whole? So how do we calculate that z-score? We have our data item, which is the x and we remove off the average, the mean. Okay, so we figure out, well, how many deviations away from the mean is it? And then we divide it by the number, uh, the standard deviation number. Okay, so if I deviate this much, how many deviations am I actually away from the mean? That's what our z-score tells us. So if x is a data item in a sample with mean x bar and the standard deviation s, then the z-score is found by looking at, well, how far away from the mean is the data item, dividing it by the standard deviation. So we can calculate the number of deviations it's actually away. So for example, if I start at zero, that's my, my mean, my average, and my standard deviation is two. If I pick a data item of six, how many deviations away from the mean is that item? So standard deviation of two units, so two, four, six, I can fit three standard deviations 
uh, to get out to that data item. So three standard deviations away from the mean. Very basic example. All right, so the x minus the x bar. What does it give us? Again, the amount that x actually deviates from the mean. We've calculated that a lot when we're trying to figure out the standard deviation. So that gives the amount that x, the data item, deviates from the mean. Okay, tells us how far away. And the direction as well. Could be positive, could be negative. Okay, to the left or to the right, similar story, like we were looking at the deviation before. So what does that tell us? The z-score reflects, then, the number of standard deviations by which that data item deviates from the mean. So it tells us specifically, well, how many deviation units away am I based on the standard? So it tells us the number of standard deviations by which the data value x deviates from the mean. Because we're picking our measure of central tendency to, to be the mean. We use that a lot. Okay, so when will that z-score be positive? So what would make z positive if this number was bigger than the mean? So it tells us our data item would be to the right of the average. So when our x value is larger than x bar, the item's to the right of the mean. Item to the right of the mean. Okay, so when is it going to be negative? When the average is larger than the data item. So it sits on the left. So when x bar is greater than x. So that would tell us the item is to the left of the mean. Much like our just normal deviation that we talked about before. Okay, and again, Chebyshev's theorem tells us what. We calculated for three standard deviations. Chebyshev's theorem says at least, at least, 89% of items lie within three standard deviations. Hopefully you can still see it. Within three standard deviations of the mean. All right, so what does that tell us? Z is typically bound between negative three and positive three then. Because a lot, almost all of the data items fit within those three standard deviations. It's actually a lot more than this typically, but this is the minimum amount. So at least 89% fit within three. All right, so typically a z-score larger than three or less than negative 3 isn't going to happen. So we kind of have an idea of what bounds are present on a z-score. All right, so let's look at an example with those z-scores. Two friends, Cyrus and Aisha, who had different history classes, had midterms on the same day. Cyrus scored an 86, we made note of that, and Aisha a 78, so circle that one as well. Based on the z-scores, which student did relatively better given the class data below. So in Cyrus's class, the average was a 73. In Aisha's, it was a 69 with the respective standard deviations. So how do we calculate the z-scores? Again, it makes it relative uh, to our data. Z-scores, we find the difference between the data item and the average, and we divide by this standard deviation. So let's go for Cyrus first just because he's written first, so our z-score for him, the data item. What did he actually score on his exam? An 86, and the average for his class was a 73. So he deviated positively from the mean. He's to the right of that. And the, the class standard deviation was 8. So we want to figure out how many deviations from the mean he actually was. So 86 minus 73, we got 13, divided by 8, which is 1.625 standard deviations from the mean. Okay, so he was out 
8 points and another 0.625 of 8 points. So 13 in total from 73. So let's calculate for Aisha. What did she score on the exam? Data value 78. And her class average was a 69. So she's still above as well for this class uh, average. But the standard deviation for her class was only 5. So she deviated from the mean 9 units, positive to the right of the mean. Standard deviation of 5, so she was 1.8 deviations away from her class's mean. He was 1.6 away from his class's mean. It's relative to their class data. All right, so what are we trying to figure out? Based on the z-scores, which student did relatively better? So relative to their own class, who had the higher z-score? Aisha did. So we want to say she was farther in the positive direction, farther from her class's average. I guess it would be, what, classes, classes, average? English, this is why I do math. Okay, but we get the idea. Farther away from her class's average, she did better relatively, even though his score was higher, relative to how the rest of the class performed, she actually uh, scored relatively better. So let's look at percentiles. Percentiles is definition of approximately n percent of the items in a distribution are less than some number in our uh, data set, some number x, then x is the nth percentile of that distribution. So that value bounds that percentage underneath uh, that marker. Okay, so an example that you've probably seen before, you might have taken the SAT. Your score is reported as a percentile. So if you were in the 83rd percentile, what does that mean? Doesn't mean you scored an 83% on the test. It's just telling you that you outscored approximately how much of the people who took the test, 83% of them. All right, so you outscored that many people were bound below you out of the total amount that took the test. You outscored approximately 83% of all who took the test. Okay, you didn't score an 83%. Does not mean you received an 83% on the exam. Okay, so that many people were trapped underneath you. 83% um, sat below you. So an example, the following are the number of dinner customers served by a restaurant on 40 consecutive days. The number have been ranked least to greatest. Thank the good Lord, because that would take a while. But it tells us, and we could even count them, that N was equal to what? How many did they actually serve? 40 consecutive days. So I have 40 different data items there. For this data set, find the 65th percentile and the 88th percentile. Okay, so how do we go for the 65th percentile? It's the item below which 65% of the data sits. Okay, so they're already ranked for us, which is nice. So the 65th percentile is the item below which 65% of that data sits, of the items are ranked. Okay, so I need to figure out which position, what place value, 
places 65% of the data below that marker. So we need to figure out well, what actually is 0.65 or 65% of our total number surveyed or number of days served. So 65% of 40, if we calculate it, is 26. So all the way up to and including the 26 item is 65% of the data. Okay, so the percentile is the marker that says 65% of it fits under this marker. So the 26th mark is a part of the 65% still. So we need to choose the marker that's above that one because 65% of it needs to be bound below the marker. So we need to take the 27th item as the 65th percentile. So we take the 27th item and we can figure out, well, what is the 27th item? So they're grouped in 10s. So we go 10, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So 68 was the 27th item, or 68 as the 65th, 65th percentile. Because again, that's my marker that says anything to the left of this, underneath it, fits 65% of all the data items. So 65% of the 40 is 26 items. So do 26 items fit below that marker? Well, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then another 10, and another 10. So 26 of them fit underneath that marker. So if we go for the 88th percentile, part B. 88% uh, of 40, going to be more than uh, this value here, is what? 88% of 40 is 35.2. Okay, but we don't have 0.2 of a data set sitting here in between. We just have whole number uh, integer values for our data. So we round up to what? In this case, the 36, because I need 35 and a little bit more to fit underneath this marker. So the next marker up is going to be the whole number, uh, item number 36. So 32.5, and we round up, because we need to fit 35.2 still underneath our marker, and 36 will do that for us. And the 36th item, or what actually is the item, so let's calculate it out, 10, 20, 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 75, 75 is the 88th percentile, to be the 88th percentile, okay, because again, if I pick that, do I have 35.2% uh, of the data still underneath, or excuse me, 88% of the data or 35.2 items underneath that marker? So what do we got? 10, 20, 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then all the way up to the 36, so we still technically have 0.2 in between there, a whole nother one value actually. So we fit. So again, we pick the marker above where the actual percentage lies, because that has to fit underneath the marker still. So these percentiles were originally conceived as a scale dividing the data into 100 different equal size parts. Okay, but if we were to take this data set, for, for instance, and divide it from 0 to 100, we're going to have a lot of empty sets from 0 up to 45. I didn't have anything. From 88 to 100, I don't have anything. So if we refine our divisions that much into 100 different pieces, we're going to have a lot of empty uh, sets. Okay, so we want to make note of that. Uh, usually it's divided up into 100 different equal size parts, but we would have many empty sets, many empty parts. Empty parts, if we divide it just up into 100 different parts on a set that's smaller like this, 
So instead, let's divide into a different refinement. So two different refinements that we're going to look at. The first one, deciles. So what happens? We pick nine different values. So we've got nine values that split up the data set into ten. So I've got nine dividers that split it into ten pieces. And those pieces, those ten pieces, are approximately equal sized parts. Approximately equal sized parts. Okay, so instead of divvying it up like a percentile into a hundred different chunks, we're breaking it up into ten different chunks. And in order to do that, we need nine dividers. So if I'm picking a quartile then, we've got three different values, so three dividers that split up the data set into four approximately equal sized parts. And I, uh, we don't really use deciles a lot, uh, but they do exist and they're not too hard to find, but we do talk about quartiles quite a bit, dividing something up into four different parts. Alright, so what does it look like? The first decile, the first divider to split up the data set into 10 is going to be what in terms of a percentile? So before with a percentile, I was just dividing it up one by one, but a decile splits it into 10. So the first decile is going to contain the first 10 pieces of our percentile. So the first decile is the first 10 or the 10th percentile. 10 of them sit within there. So the second decile would be what percentile? The 20th, okay, divided up into 10 versus individually one by one. Okay, so we get the idea. The third decile is the 30th percentile. And then the last one, the ninth decile, since we only need nine dividers, is the 90th percentile because then it splits it up into 10, when we're talking about deciles, approximately equal sized parts. So we're going to use that. We want to find the fourth decile from the previous dinner example. And I already erased the data, but you can still flip back and look at it. So what does the fourth decile mean? Fourth decile means what percentile? What percent of the data has to fit underneath this marker means the 40th percentile. So what is 40% of all of our data? We had 40 items. 16. So 16 data items makes up 40% of that whole. So we need to pick one larger than this. So 17, 17th item is going to be our fourth decile. So the fourth decile, decile will be the 17th item, or what actually is the item. So looking back, counting in 10, and then another 7, we get to 64. So that value, 64 from our data set, is the fourth decile. So 40% of the data fits below this marker. All right. Looking at quartiles then, I need three dividers to split up uh, our data set into four approximately equal sized parts. So how do we find those quartiles? And we have that line that'll be kind of our visual data set to talk about what's going on. So for any data set that's ranked least to greatest, so we need that to happen, ranked least to greatest. The second quartile, so not the first divider, but the second one happens at the median, which makes sense. If I have to divide it up into four different parts, well, the one in the middle of my three divisions will be the second division, and it happens at the median. So the second quartile, or Q2, happens exactly in the middle, and we know how to find those. Then the first quartile, the first divider, is going to happen where? So we're looking to split up 
from the beginning of our set to Q2 into another half. So that's going to be the median of the lower half of the data because we want the middle of the first half. So that'll be the median of all the items below what? Quartile 2, our first median. So I've got one chunk, two chunks. We need 3 and 4. So where is Q3 going to happen? We can draw it in visually. And how do we describe this process? Again, I want the median of any of the data points that lie above Q2, much like below that we just looked at. So Q3, or the third quartile, is the median of all the items above Q2, above our original median overall. So now we've divided up into four different equally sized parts, and we only need one, two, three dividers. So let's find the three different quartiles for the restaurant example that we were looking at. We still have the data. And how many consecutive days did they actually record the data for? So n is equal to 40, 40 consecutive days. So to find Q2, the middlemost divider, we have to figure out where the median of the overall data happens at. So position of the median, we looked at that on Tuesday. How do we find it? Take the number of data items that we have, add 1 to it, and divide by 2. So 41 divided by 2 is the 20 and a half item. So what does that tell me? Between the 20th and the 21st item is where the median lies, where that divider needs to sit. So Q2 or the median that we're finding. What is the 20th item? 65, we can look back and count. And the 21st item was 66. And we want the average of those two. So 65.5 is Q2. That is our second quartile. All right, so now let's go for Q1. And what does that mean? We're looking for the median of the first what? The first 20 items, because we've taken it and we split it in half. 20 below, 20 above this quartile, Q2. All right, so halfway between 20, where is it going to sit? What items? Okay, so the 10th item, where is it sitting? 59 is our 10th item. Then the 11th happens at 60. We want the average of those two. So we get 59.5. That's our first quartile. Okay, then for Q3, what are we looking for? Q3, we're looking for the median of the last 20 data items. So where is that one going to sit? Okay, so what item are we taking? First, we're looking at 69. You can count out halfway in between those 20. Next one, 70. We want the average. So we've got 69.5 is the third quartile for that data set. All right. Last piece to talk about, visual display of data, is this box plot. And we can actually visually write in all of the information that we've just calculated as well. Because a box plot gives us what? The division in the, in the middle is Q2, gives us the median overall of all the data. Okay, the leftmost part of the box is Q1. The rightmost is Q3 dividing it up into how many different parts? One, two, three, four. So it tells me the middle range of the data. And then the things sticking out in the end, these are called whiskers. So this one's a whisker, and this one is a whisker. So we've got our box and our whisker plot, if you want to call it that. And the whiskers don't necessarily have to be symmetric like they're drawn for us. So what's the different information that these box plots actually convey? tells us where the median is 
we're looking at our measure of central tendency there. Measure of central tendency. Because visually we can see that the data uh, falls in the middle right there. It also gives us the range. It gives us the measure of dispersion because we can see the lowest value of the data item and the highest. So it tells us the measure of dispersion, how many different units are in between the least and the greatest data item in the set. We have the location of the middle half of the data. The box is super important. So the box's extent gives us the middle portion. And then if there is any skewness, so if the whiskers aren't proportional on each side, it tells us it's not symmetric and it's skewed somehow. So non-symmetric or non-symmetry of either the box, it can happen with that too. Maybe the median sits over here more. This doesn't have to be symmetric. The whiskers don't have to be symmetric either. One could be really long, one could be really short, and it could be skewed left or right, or both of them at the same time. So we have those different options. Doesn't have to be symmetric. So our last example in this section, we want to construct a box plot for the number of hours watching TV in a week. And again, it's given to us in a stem and leaf plot. The stem is the first digit of the number. The leaves are the second. So again, how do we read it? Number of hours of TV watched, 5, 10, 12, 13, 15, 17, 18, 19, 21, 25, 27. We get the idea. So in total, again, how many people did we actually survey for this thing? We can count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So it's a check for me to make sure I wrote it down right anyway. We have those 20 data items. So we need to start dividing up all of this data. So where is Q2? Where is exactly in the middle of this data? So Q2, or the median, is happening where? It's going to be halfway between what? 10 and 11. 20 plus 1 divided by 2. And we have a 0.5 item, so we have to pick between the 10th and the 11th. So where do those sit? So I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So in between here is where Q2 is sitting. So what data values do we have to the left and the right of that divider? So we can find the average. If you can see it, great. But I've got 25 is the 10th item, and the 11th is 27. We want the average of those two, so 26 is Q2. Okay, so now for the lower 10 uh, underneath Q2, those data items, what is the middle of that set? So for Q1, trying to figure out the median of the lower 10 of those data. So it's going to be between the 5th and the 6th data items. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So what values do we have here to the left and the right of that Q1? We've got 15 and 17. Average of those two is 16. So Q1, 16, and then Q3. So the half of the upper values. Q3, half of the upper portion of the data. What items are we looking at between these two? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the 5th and 6th of the upper portion, so we've got 36 and 38. Average of those two, 37, fitting in between there. All right, but we have to make it fit on our picture nicely. We have the quartiles, but what about the range? So we want to figure out what's the lowest value that ever shows up, five hours, and then the highest is 45. So we have to make that fit nicely on our number line, the range in between them, uh, how many units are in between there? 40 units. So we have to make 40 units fit nicely on this number line. So I'm going to take it and say the bottom down here is 5, top one is 45, and we have to fit 40 units in between there. So I'm going to do it in increments of 5 just to make it look nice. So we've got 5. 10, 
15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. Okay, and it's pretty, pretty scaled, but anyway, yours is probably better. All right, so that's just dividing up our number line, so we have a scale. Now we actually want to draw the box and the whiskers. So where was our median Q2 happening at? 26. So 25 is here, so here is my median Q2 happened at 26. So that was the middle of all the data. The middle of the lower chunk of data was at 16. So Q1, the end of the box, happens at 16. The upper bound for the box happened at 37, Q3 was at 37, Q3 was at 37. So we can connect those together. Here's my middle range of the data, sits between 16 and 37. Okay, but the whisker on the left hand side has to come all the way out to where? To 5, since we span data that still lives inside of here, and the lowest value that we had in our data set was 5. So our whisker has got to come all the way out to 5 on that side. And over here, largest span again, we made it fit on our picture really nicely, all the way out to 45. So just looking at it, the middle portion is pretty symmetric, but it looks like this whisker is a little bit shorter than this other whisker because we have more data units here between the lowest data item in Q1 than we do over here from Q3 up to 45. Okay, so they're not always symmetric, but visually it's a great display of what the data looks like. All right, so again, if you have any questions, let me know. I'll see you guys on Tuesday.